Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Gabris. I probably yeah, talked to most, like most of you uh, over email. Um, we're going to get started at 110. Um, so just so you know, this is an on-the-record briefing with NTSB Chair Jennifer Hamandy and Rob Hall, who's a director of the Office of Railroad Pipeline and Hazardous Materials. Um, they're going to discuss the factual information that we know to date, as well as rail safety. Um, Chair Hamandy is going to give some brief remarks, and then she'll do some Q&A. During the Q&A, if you could raise your hand, say your name and the outlet, um, and then she'll answer your questions. Okay? And like I said... 
Could you, I'm sorry, could you spell the uh, other gentleman's name who's going to be here? Oh. Okay. Can you, can you, yeah, sure. the Paul is can, you, can you spell it at the microphone so we all get the information? Oh, sure. Thank you. Um, sure, go ahead and roll on it. Rob Hall, R O B H A L L. And his title again right. is? He's the director of the Office of Railroad Pipeline and Hazardous okay. Materials. And that's a single person that's going to talk to us. The chair is going to be the primary um, spokesperson, so that's Jennifer Homendy. Um, normal spelling of Jennifer, H-O-M-E-N-D-Y. Cool, thank you. Rob. Who's that? Oh, thank you. I like these simple names. Oh, for sure. Perfect. Thank you, Dan. You? Um, yeah, I'm at 33, I think. All right. Thanks, man. Yeah. 32 is so old with me. But I think it's so sunny. 32. 32. I like 33, Alex. This is a team you're going to join. Yeah. 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 Heads up. All right, thank you for joining us. As uh, Jennifer said, my name is Jennifer Hammondy, and I'm the chair of the National Transportation Safety Board. With me today is Rob Hall. He is the director of our Office of Rail, Pipelines, and Hazardous Materials Investigations. I want to start with the people of East Palestine. 
I am so sorry for the traumatic event that you're going through. It's devastating. Over the course of my career, and I've handled rail and pipeline and hazmat for well over 25 years, both Rob and I have sat with communities, with residents after devastating rail, pipeline, hazardous materials releases. We've talked to community members who are suffering health effects, have pets who've died, have damage to businesses and homes. But I can tell you this much, this was 100% preventable. We call things accidents, there is no accident. Every single event that we investigate is preventable. So our hearts are with you. Know that the NTSB has one goal, and that is safety and ensuring that this never happens again. So with that, the NTSB has been on the ground since day one. We completed our investigative work on scene, our on-scene work, yesterday. But we still have a lot of work to do as part of this investigation. So today, I'm announcing that the NTSB will hold a rare investigative field hearing this spring in East Palestine. We don't have investigative hearings often. It is rare. But we will question invited witnesses. Now our goals, we have four goals for conducting a investigative field hearing. Number one, inform the public. Number two, collect factual information from witnesses. Number three, discuss possible solutions. And number four, build consensus for change. As you know, we also released this morning our prelim preliminary report on the derailment. The report does not contain a probable cause that comes at the end of the investigation. It contains only factual information collected during the on-scene portion of this investigation. What I want to focus on today is what we know so far. I want to talk about our investigative process, and then I want to share some information generally about rail safety. We know for a fact that this derailment occurred at car number 23. This train had three locomotives, two at the head end. The lead locomotive had three crew members, including one trainee. A, the third locomotive was between rail cars 109 and 110. There were also 149 rail cars on the train. Car number 23 was a hopper car, which carried plastic pellets. It was the combination of the hot axle and the plastic pellets which started the initial fire. Now the train passed three wayside defect de detectors which identify overheated bearings and provide an audible warning to train crews. At each detector, the recorded temperature of the bearing increased from 38 degrees Fahrenheit above the ambient temperature, which at the time was 10 degrees Fahrenheit, to 103 degrees above ambient just 10 miles later. Both of those temperatures are considered by Norfolk Southern to be non-critical. The critical threshold per Norfolk Southern is above 200 degrees ambient. Upon passing the third detector with a temperature of 253 degrees above ambient, that's critical, 253 degrees above ambient, a critical audible alarm message sounded instructing the crew to slow and stop the train to inspect the hot axle, and if warranted, to set car number 23 out. Now, NTSB investigators at this time have not identified any operational issues with the wayside defect detectors, but we're still looking at them. 
There's also no evidence of track defects. The engineer at the time was following another train and was already in dynamic braking to slow behind the train. So he increased the brake application to further slow and stop the train, meaning he responded immediately. We have no evidence that the crew did anything wrong. And during this deceleration, the wheel bearing failed. Car number 23 derailed, and the train initiated an emergency brake application and came to a stop. So the emergency brake application was triggered by the derail. Now in total, 38 cars derailed and a fire ensued which damaged an additional 12 cars. On February 5th, responders mitigated the fire, but five Five cars, which are designated as 105, DOT 105 specification tank cars, were located near the number 23, which derailed. So we had the five vinyl chloride cars. Four of them were at 26, 27, 28, and 29, and the fifth one was at 53. They were carrying well over 115,000 gallons of vinyl chloride. Now that continued to concern authorities because the temperature inside one of the tank cars was increasing, which could result in a catastrophic explosion. The critical point is 180 degrees, and at the time, one of the cars was reading 140 degrees. As you know, the responders then scheduled a controlled venting of the five vinyl chloride tank cars to release and burn the vinyl chloride. The NTSB had no role in the decision making or carrying out of the vent and burn. And I want to repeat that. We are not part of the decision making or the carrying out of the vent and burn. The Federal Railroad Administration has guidance for how to conduct vent and burns. So as part of our investigation, we will evaluate whether the vent and burn was carried out according to that guidance and whether that guidance needs to be updated. With respect to the tank cars transporting the hazmat, the train consist, that's the list of what's included in the train by car, included 20 hazmat tank cars transporting combustible liquids, uh, mostly uh, lubricants and cooking oil, flammable gas and the vinyl chloride. 17 of those 20 tank cars were fully loaded. Three were residue cars. All of those cars were placarded, though the placards were plastic and melted. Aluminum also melted, melts. So we are looking at uh, that situation and we'll determine whether we recommend uh, something else that could protect placards. Placards are there to tell emergency responders what is on a tank car and what the dangers are to themselves and to others. They are critical in response and in protecting the community. Yesterday, our investigators conducted a detailed damage assessment of the tank cars, including identifying and measuring breaching damages, noting where entire lading was lost, the condition of pressure relief devices, and other service equipment, underframes, and welded attachments. They also secured the top fittings on the vinyl chloride tank cars including the pressure relief devices, and we're sending those to Texas to be tested. The wheel bearing from car number 23 has also been collected, and that will come to NTSB headquarters. We have a recorder laboratory, and we also have a materials laboratory that will come to our materials laboratory. So here's what we're focused on in this investigation. The wheel set and the bearing. Roller bearings typically last the life of a wheel set, but they do have a finite life. 
typically between 100,000 and 300,000 miles. There are a number of causes for overheated roller bearings. These could include fatigue cracking, water damage, mechanical damage, a loose bearing, or a wheel defect, and we will look at all that. We will look at rail car design and maintenance practices of Norfolk Southern, as well as Norfolk Southern's inspection procedures. We'll also look at any history of prior accidents involving car number 23 and this wheel set. We'll look at tank car design and derailment damage. The 105 vinyl chloride cars were insulated, which actually helped at the beginning. There are federal regulations which state that that car needs to be able to be cooled for 100 minutes. We all know the fire lasted well, belong 100, well uh, longer than the 100 minutes. What that means is after that time, the insulation actually kept the car from cars from cooling. So we're going to look at that. Also, 15 DOT 111 tank cars tra were transporting hazmat. Those, those were on the train. Now, why does that matter? Because uh, current law requires certain DOT 111s transporting class three flammable materials only to be retrofitted or replaced with DOT 117 tank cars. I'm sorry, replaced, not retrofitted. Replaced with DOT 117 uh, tank cars. Of those three, two did not breach. One lost the entire lading. Now it's important to note that the damages to all 15 111 tank cars, including the ones that are not captured in current law, uh, were typical of DOT 111 performance we've noted in numerous previous accident investigations. So we're going to look at the 111 tank cars as well. In the course of the investigation, we'll also look at Norfolk Southern's use of wayside defect detectors. We're going to look at the spacing of those detectors whether information is or should be monitored in real time with data trending from a control center. And we'll look at the temperature thresholds, which indicate immediate action once an overheated bearing is detected. Again, spacing and temperature are set by the railroads and vary considerably by railroads. We'll also look at how crews are alarmed and, in, and the instructions for responding to those alarms. Now, roller bearings fail, but it's absolutely critical for problems to be identified and addressed early so these aren't run until failure. I'm going to quote a report from the Transport Safety, Transportation Safety Board of Canada in a 2013 report which looked at wayside defect detectors and roller bearings. They said, it is recognized in the railway industry that wheel set roller bearings can fail catastrophically in as few as 10 to 15 miles on a train traveling at track speed. You cannot wait until they've failed. Problems need to be identified early, so something catastrophic like this does not occur again. This, of course, was much earlier than 10 to 15 miles, so we're going to look at that. Finally, we're going to look at the accident response, including how responders and the public received information prior to and right after the derailment. An informed public can be prepared to implement protective actions when accidents occur. While the general public may not require detailed information, such as the specific numbers, dates, and times of hazmat tank cars traveling on any route, they need to know, absolutely deserve to know, whether they live or work near a hazmat route. They also need to be aware of the hazards associated with releases, 
what railroads will do to prevent accidents and mitigate consequences, how to recognize and respond to an emergency, what protective action to take in the event of a hazmat release, and how to contact railroads and federal authorities regarding specific concerns, and that should also include state authorities. Now, we've issued a number of recommendations, rail safety recommendations. These are recommendations to improve rail safety following tragedies. Some of these recommendations go toward urging railroads to work with communities on the emergency planning, on routing, what should be routed and not routed through communities, and what information the general public and emergency responders need and deserve. So now I'm gonna move into what is the NTSB's process. We are still in the fact-finding phase. You might say what takes so long. We know what derailed the train. We have a lot of questions. In the initial stages of any investigation, we often receive information that's inaccurate. So we have to ask a lot of questions. And those questions create more questions so that we dig deep. We are very methodical in our investigative process. That takes time. Now, in this fact-finding phase, we have what we call parties to an investigation. These are groups of people who have factual, who can help us gather the facts after a terrible tragedy. In this one, we have the US DOT's Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, the Federal Railroad Administration, Ohio State Highway Patrol, the Village of East Palestine, Norfolk Southern Railway, Trinity Industries Leasing Company, GATX Corporation, those two deal with rail cars, manufacturing of rail cars, and we have four unions, the Brotherhood of Railway Carmen, the International Association of Sheet Metal, Air, Rail, and Transportation Workers, the Bro Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, and we just added the International Association of Firefighters. Now these entities help us gather the facts around investigations. There's an advantage to that for them too. They get the facts when we get the facts and they can take immediate action to improve safety. They do not have to wait for the end of our investigation and should not wait. We expect them to act. Once the fact finding is concluded, which takes a few months, then everyone will agree in the facts that will goes, go into factual reports, which will be included in our public docket. Then uh, we will go into our analysis phase. None of those entities are part of the analysis phase. They cannot. The NTSB is an independent federal entity, and we need to remain independent. So we conduct the analysis of those facts, and we issue safety recommendations in a final report as well as findings, the probable cause or causes, because there could be contributing causes. Uh, and for this one, it'll probably be 12 to 18 months from now. But here's what I'm gonna say to the communities, because you might be saying, what takes so long? Again, it takes a long time. We are very deliberative. We are the gold standard when it comes to investigations globally. And we are methodical in our approach. But if we see a safety issue that we need addressed immediately, immediately, something systemic, we will not hesitate to issue an urgent safety recommendation. We did that just a few months ago, and FAA, FAA acted on that immediately so that process works. And we will not hesitate to do it again, especially in this one. So with that, there is a lot more work to do. Um, so I'm just gonna pledge to the community and to others, we never go away. Our whole goal is to improve safety, to issue safety recommendations to prevent this so East Palestine and other communities never experience this again. 
we will work then after those safety recommendations are issued to get those recommendations implemented. There are recommendations we have consistently worked on for 50 years. Positive train control is a great example. We don't give up and we won't give up on this one. So thank you, I'm gonna um, take questions. Please raise your hand and um, state your name and your affiliation. I'm Jeff. Yes. Sheldon Ingram, WTAE TV, Pittsburgh's Action News 4. Um, the fact that the crew didn't try to stop the train until it reached that critical stage, does that suggest a system-wide failure that they weren't alerted or didn't react sooner than when it reached 253 degrees? So the question is, uh, why did the crew re not react at the, at the, after the first two wayside detectors where it was uh, identified 38 degrees above ambient temperature, which was 10 degrees at the time, and then 103 degrees. They did not react till 253. They, those two initial temperatures are designated by Norfolk Southern as non-critical. It, the information they receive is they don't have to do anything, so they were following procedures. Once they got the critical alarm of 253, they took immediate action. In your estimation, does that warning threshold have to change? We're going to look, at, so the question is, does that warning threshold have to change? The warning threshold is set by railroads, and again, it varies by railroad. We're going to look at that and see if that threshold should have changed, should change. That's going to be one of our priorities in this investigation. Tom. Tom Costello with NBC News. Is there any suggestion yet what actually caused the overheating? You said there's a list of possibilities, but is mm. there any leading candidate what was causing this overheating with the bearings and potentially then the axle? The question is what was, what was causing uh, the overheating of the bearing and therefore the axle? It's a great question and it's something we have to look at as part of this investigation. Right now we've collected uh, information that we need on scene, the type of information that goes away when we release all the rail cars and when we release the scene. But that is exactly what we have to look at. I'll tell you one thing. We have one of our incredibly skilled investigators looking for other cameras along the route just to see if we could see other things. Uh, you know, there was that one video uh, that was uh, aired. We want to see if there are other ones because what we're getting from the defect detectors, we want to make sure, does that match up? So we're, we're digging into that. Amanda. Um, uh, was it too late by the time they were notified of 253 degrees Fahrenheit and is that something that should be set by the government? Uh, I will tell you that had there been a detector earlier, it would not have, that, that derailment may not have occurred. Um, but that's something we have to look at. And we'll have to look at lack of federal regulation, see if there's any guidance from the Association of American Railroads on that and what they follow. Uh, but that is definitely something we have to look at because there is a great amount of variance between uh, different railroads. Does that answer your question? You. Alan. Hi, th uh, thank you very much, Alan Levin with Bloomberg News. I'm uh, interested in these uh, wheel bearing detectors or Have you done investigations in the past in which the, those were causal um, and do you have any existing recommendations on, on them? Uh, do you want to answer that, Rob? I'm going <laughs> to not, not stumble over here. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, we don't have any uh, go, go over here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we don't have any current recommendations on those. Uh, I would point out that the hot box detector would not be causal. The cause is the bearing, overheating. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other detectors as well in addition to hot box. They do use acoustic detectors to detect noisy bearings, which is another indication of 
a failure. So. But no investigations in which the hot box was part of that chain. At least not in the last decade. Blair Miller with Cox Media Group here in D.C. Um, you talked about testing of the equipment, whether it's in Texas or here. How important, how key will that be in your investigation? The question is how uh, important the testing of the different components uh, that we have identified for uh, further evaluation, how key that is to our investigation, incredibly key. We want to see what caused that wheel bearing to fail. And then we want to see uh, how those top fittings performed on the vinyl chloride tank cars. So that that will be key to our those will be key to our investigation. Uh, Ian Dunn, coming to the Washington Post. I just I another am. question on the threshold. Um, I saw some report in this morning that 95 degree difference between the bearings on each side of the train is a common threshold. It looks like Norfolk Southern set that at 115. I think there's this potentially a greater than 95 degree difference at the second detector. So it's it's a measurement of the different sides of the train, so the different wheel bearings, and it's the difference between the two, which Norfolk Southern sets at one fifth greater than one fifteen. So the one oh three would not have been critical for them. So is Norfolk Southern out of the ordinary and having that at one fifteen instead of ninety five? That's what we have to look at. Again, each railroad sets a different threshold, and we've seen different variances. Uh, I mentioned that Transport Canada report from 2013. CP and C, they, the Transport Canada notes the differences between how Canadian Pacific and Canadian National uh, uh, designate their thresholds and designate where wayside detectors are. Can I, can I actually, sorry, I just, could you explain? maybe paint a picture for us. Is this a box, an infrared box on the side of the tracks that the train goes by? I guess I'm trying to visualize how exactly this works. And I'm picturing a, a box with a, a an infrared scanner that is reading the under the undercarriage of the train. Is that accurate? Yeah, it actually points up, but I will let uh, our experts. Yeah, that's, that's essentially what it is. <laughs> that's essentially what it is. In this case, it was down on the ground, pointing up. Uh, the train goes over the top of it. Over the top of it. Okay. In some of these wayside detectors, not here, they're actually a shed that the train drives through, uh, which protects everything from the elements. Uh, but there are a number of different types of detectors. Again, it's something that's not regulated. And is it using an infrared beam, or help help me make sure we're using the right language here? How that's my understanding is that it's infrared based. Yes. Uh, then we'll go over here. Sorry, uh, Zach Fletcher at uh, the Hill. Uh, thanks for coming to the window. Uh, can you speak to whether or not there's been any determination, uh, whether you can say at this point whether there was any wrongdoing on North and Southern's part? Uh, you know, the question is, was there any wrongdoing on Norfolk Southern's part? We'll have to evaluate that du during our analysis. Once we have all the facts, we will look at the analysis. I think um, we, or we will do our own analysis. The advantage to having the Federal Railroad Administration and the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration as parties to our investigation is they have enforcement authority. They are getting the factual information when we are getting the factual information, so they can take action on enforcement. They'll know. Time to sign up, Politico. It seems from your report and what you said here that um, the engineer braked and then the automatic emergency braking kicked in, mm -hmm. um, and then they got out and visually saw that the train had derailed and that there was a fire. Was there no other way for them to be alerted that the train had derailed and that there was a fire which seemed to have happened before they started, before they got out of the train? Uh, so uh, the question is on the sequence of events uh, once uh, the train crew was alerted to the uh, uh, high temperature. They get an alert in the locomotive cab. 
In this situation, they were already in braking mode because of a train in front of them. Uh, so they began to slow the train and stop the train, but then the derailment occurred, and uh, uh, that engaged the emergency brake application. Uh, the notification comes directly to the cab of the locomotive and tells them. We're going to look at the notifications and how that comes across and Norfolk Southern's policies and, uh, uh, for notification to rail crews. I will tell you it's standard. Rail crews uh, uh, disconnected the locomotive from the cars that were burning and uh, moved up about a mile to uh, protect themselves. That is standard as part of railroad operations. The question is, what gives me the certainty that this was 100% preventable? We've never seen an accident that isn't preventable. And I, I actually think that I don't like the word accident. I hate to use it. Nothing is an accident. And so, uh, you know, when it comes to prevention, it could be actions on, be, on, on the railroad's part for uh, maybe not having more conservative policies on thresholds, or it could be some sort of uh, problem with the wheel bearing that could have been addressed earlier. Those are just examples. We don't know that yet. We are still uh, uh, conducting our fact-finding portion of the investigation, but we will know that at some point. That's when we issue the probable cause, and there's often not just one probable cause, which is this derailed. It's usually a number of contributing uh, factors that uh, that that contribute, uh, a number of factors that contributed to that derailment. A quick follow-up, if I may. I, I was just wondering if you could talk about the level of cooperation NTSB has been getting from the parties. I know that in, in certain instances, sometimes rare, that you issue subpoenas. Is that something that you might? So the question is, what is the cooperation uh, between the NTSB and the parties to our investigation, and whether we foresee having to issue subpoenas? At this time, I don't foresee having to issue subpoenas. We are having excellent uh, cooperation uh, with all the parties to our investigation. We're getting what we've asked for thus far. Uh, so, so far, so good. Um, that can always change. Uh, but we do have an established relationship with all these entities, and, uh, and we are hopeful that will continue throughout the course of this investigation. I mean, you know, we'll look at uh, the question is why so many cars derailed, 38 derailed uh, in the, in the uh, accident uh, scenario. This is something we've seen before. There are different forces in play uh, when the train is braking and moving, and we often see bunching up of rail cars. This is, uh, you know, un unfortunate, but yes, that's what we see. What are we investigating that's preventable? Pretty much everything about this accident. It's everything from the wheel bearing to the rail cars to the tank cars to the actions of uh, federal entities or inaction of federal entities. Uh, we'll look at state entities. We'll look at locals, we, especially with emergency response and information they did or did not have, uh, likely did not have. Um, and we'll look at uh, Norfolk Southern, their policies. So. There, is a, there are often a lot of uh, uh, considerations in, in what goes into what is preventable. There is usually far more than one thing. Madam Chair, can I ask two quick questions? One of them, I'm wondering, did the crew know that the temperature was increasing? When they went over the first two 
hot box detectors. Is there any reading for them telling them it's getting hotter? Just be aware that it's getting hotter, even if it did not yet rise to the level of alert. That's the first question. The second one is, you of course are an investigative body and you offer recommendations. You are not a regulator. You can't force change on any <laughs> on any participant. Uh, and yet this has been uh, an industry that you have tried for many years to bring a little bit more regulatory safety controls uh, and then Congress has at times uh, kind of undermined those initiatives that uh, the DOT under previous administrations had tried to enact. I'm just wondering your level of frustration, you said you're committed to going forward here, but your level of frustration that this has been uh, in many ways something that for decades you, the FRA, Congress has looked at, and yet not a lot of progress. So again, those two questions if you don't mind. I'm going to let you answer the first one. If you can repeat the question, then I'll do the second one. Did the crew have any knowledge that the temperature was rising as they went over the first two hot box detectors? The detectors, the way that they're designed, will provide a radio announcement. And so the radio in the cab would indicate that there is an issue. There's a number of things in the, in the radio announcement that occurs. Uh, anything from no defects to the total number of axles, it would have announced the temperatures at this particular axle and told them which axle it was from the front. Just an automated computer voice kind of thing. Yes. On the radio saying, yes. This is your speed, and at the, or this is the temperature rather, and yes, it did not yet rise to a critical level. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. And again, uh, your yeah, I, thoughts about the other issue. And uh, I was asked my, about my thoughts on the level of frustration on our rail safety recommendations. We don't have the authority to act on recommendations. We issue safety recommendations to the entities uh, that might be involved. It could be Norfolk Southern, could be FRA, could be the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, could be rail car companies. We'll just have to see who that is. I want to I want to just talk a little uh, let me back up a little bit on this because I do want to highlight numbers. I've seen this 1096 number out there on derailments. That includes class 1s, the commuter railroads, the Amtrak and the short line railroads. If you're just looking at the class 1 freight railroads and I looked at this myself uh, just the other night, confirmed it with FRA, if you're just looking at derailments uh, it's in 2021 for Class 1 freight railroads. So it's the major railroads. We're talking Norfolk Southern, CSX, uh, uh, BNSF, uh, UP, CN, CP. So uh, what, what we have is um, 868 derailments in 2021, 68 collisions, 330 that are designated as other a lot of those are obstructions on rail track. And so, you know, I, I raise that because of we can improve safety in the rail industry. And we have a number of our safety recommendations that are on our most wanted list of transportation safety improvements that we have been fighting for for decades to get implemented, which would improve rail safety. But I want to be clear we have to make sure that what we're proposing as the NTSB is specific to this accident. That's our job. Our job is to determine how this happened and to issue safety recommendations to prevent this one from happening again. That's why I got so frustrated and tweeted. Nobody tweets for me. I tweet my own tweets. Uh, that's why I got so frustrated and tweeted, because there's a lot of misinformation on what would have prevented this, and I'm happy to go through some of those. This is a community that has been devastated. They deserve to know what happened, how to prevent it from happening again. They deserve to have the right solutions. After, you know, often during our investigations, everyone is guessing. I saw it all over media, which was driving me nuts. And, you know, the, uh, those solutions, all of the ones I heard of are not the solutions. And so you know, we'll do a little evaluation to prove that they're not. But I get frustrated because what happens is everybody jumps to those solutions. And then when we issue our final report, we get ignored. 
That is frustrating. So when we issue our final recommendations, I want, I'm, I want Norfolk Southern to act if, they're, if they get one. I want FRA and FIMSA to act if they get some. I want others to. We need action on what would prevent that from happening again. That is our goal. The question is, uh, when were we notified of the derailment? I, I do. I am going to let Rob uh, answer this question, but I'm going to start with: we do have a response operations center that works 24/7, dedicated professionals that are monitoring social media. They have television screens. They get uh, input from the National Response Center, which is where the railroads and others are supposed to report uh, any type of tragedy. Uh, but for this one, I will uh, let Rob uh, address the specific question. And specifically at the moment where the toxic chemicals leak, when were you notified and the community as well? So our notification would be the notification with the accident. Uh, there is, the Coast Guard operates a National Response Center, which you can think of as a 911 for the country. All the railroads have to report to these accidents to that uh, Coast Guard Center, who then uh, reports that to our own Response Operations Center. And that, through that, we get the notification. In this particular case, I think it was about an hour for the notification. So with regard to the toxic chemicals, we're notified of the derailment and the fact that there's a fire with it. I mean, that's the extent of the notification to us. The first responders, they're the ones that, that get to the scene and they look for those placards so that they can make sure the community is safe. Uh, the question is about the polymerization that was going on in the vinyl chloride uh, tank cars and why one tank car and not the other tank cars. So vinyl chloride, it's a monomer, and it's actually the monomer from which we make PVC, polyvinyl chloride. And so there was a chemical reaction. It was initiated by the vinyl chloride monomer getting too hot. And, of course, in a fire environment like that, the amount of heat flux on each car is going to be a little different. So the car that was uh, observed to have the rising temperature probably had the highest heat flux during a fire. Uh, that polymerization reaction is an exothermic reaction. So it's going to add heat to the car, which is why the car was, temperature was rising. It does reach a point where the temperature added by the reaction 